newspapers and the media today in our own country tell us that one out of every two marriages end up in divorce. There's hardly a newspaper article in any major newspaper that doesn't talk about uh, mothers taking care of their children with, without the benefit of a husband or a father, or they've been abandoned. Single parent family units in you say, is this a rather new phenomenon? Not really. And the great saint in the church, Saint Helen, was a single mother. It's a story of a woman who is used by someone, is left with a child, and that someone leaves. It's a story about a young child who later became great, a great emperor and a saint, who grew up without the benefit of his father and the love of the father. So it is a contemporary story, although it is certainly 1,750 years old, roughly. So therefore, it, the story is as fresh as today and it is as old as the dust bins of ancient history. St. Helen was born in the third century around 254 in the city of Drepanum, which later became called Helenopolis. And uh, she was born to an innkeeper, had very humble beginnings. And it's also interesting to note that uh, not the first, but among the early women saints to be called Is Apostolos, or equal to the apostles. And let's face it, we're talking now the third century. And women at that time were considered perhaps a little bit more valuable than property in and of itself. These were fierce times, ruthless emperors, and not just a ruthless emperor, but a series of ruthless emperors that just continued to slaughter Christians uh, with, with hardly any kind of uh, uh, excuse or any kind of reason. St. Helen's father was an innkeeper of the times. And upon reaching the age of 16, an incident happened that would indeed change not only her life, but the world. Flavius Constantius, a military tribune, was to stay in the inn that night while his troops out in the fields slept in their tents. And as was typical in those days, he uh, not only sought lodging and food, but a young lady to keep him warm. The innkeeper, when he saw before him this strapping, young, handsome man of position, decided that he would offer not just any peasant girl, but he would offer Flavius his own daughter, who is Helen, 16 years old, a very pretty, blonde, young girl. And that night, Flavius sleeps with Helen. Upon leaving the inn the next day, Flavius left behind one of his garments with his initials engraved in it and some money for the innkeeper that in case the young lady became pregnant or there was difficulties she would be taken care of sure enough after he departs it's quickly discovered that helen has remained pregnant has become pregnant by flavius constantine nine months later she bears his son who she names constantine of course flavius now is long gone and then she has to raise constantine herself on her own with her family support perhaps but on her own, a single mother, something that a lot of women in our situation here in America, our country, our time, now have to deal with also. Constantine, in essence, comes from a single parent family. I think it could have been very easy for Helen to justify to herself why uh, she shouldn't have aborted Constantine, uh, or at least have him, have it abandoned him. I mean, let's face it, in a sense, in a very real sense, she was a child herself, only being 16 years old at the time but she chose not to but because of that choice think of the consequences in the sense that here this young child born out of wedlock uh, would one day in his own way change the course of human history certainly the course of christianity the role that christianity would take in the greatest empire of the world at that time many times we look back at saints and we put them on a particular realm uh, however we have to realize that saints were people like we are. And in particular, uh, many times, uh, their circumstances were quite different than ours. We, too often we say that we're living in the worst times. If we look back at first, second, third, fourth centuries, we can know with certainty that these times are much better than they were in the first 400 years. What father do we know today that would offer up his daughter as part of a, uh, a cultural tradition would offer up his daughter? Not too many, at least not in this country. It's interesting that St. Constantine was born in this inn, was conceived also in this inn, a very peasant type of setting, much like and reminiscent in parallel to Jesus' birth in the manger. 
And for 10 years, Helen, as a young teenager, and then as a young woman, raises the child, Constantine, by herself. This is the first step in the greatness of Helen. She was a young mother, an unwed mother, a teen mother, and yet she endured. Nine years later, Flavius comes back as governor, and now as governor, obviously, he has guards around him, he has a, a whole system of people around him, and it's not as if Helen will be able to go and rush to him and say, behold your son. She decides that she's going to let her life continue on as it is, not drawing more attention to her or to her son, and to continue on in the life that she has grown accustomed to with nine-year-old Constantine. One day, some soldiers, horsemen, are in the area and stay overnight. In the morning, when they come down to retrieve their horses, they see Constantine, now nine years old, playing around with the horses. Typical boy, typical kid. And they, upon seeing this, start beating the boy for treating their horses this way. Helen hears the commotion, comes running out, attempts to stop them. She cries out, stop, don't hit my son. He is the governor's child. I'm sure the reaction was, you and who else? She ran into the house and retrieved the robe that Flavius had given her with his initials on it when he was the military tribune of the area. Helen does what any good loving mom would do to protect her son. And she basically said, don't you know who, who his daddy is? <laughs> <laughs> and they said no, <laughs> so she told them, they didn't believe it, she comes out, here he is, shows the cape, and uh, the smirks left the faces of the soldiers. The horsemen returned to the residence of the governor and informed them of what's just transpired. Flavius's reaction was interesting. Some would expect that he would have said, yeah, right, not my child, I've had many other women, uh, they can all claim, but instead he took responsibility. He, he brought Constantine and Helen into his care. I think he reacted with a sense of nobility because he did not seek to uh, banish her or buy her off, but he sought to marry her and legitimize the birthright of his son. She was not prideful and took the position of a secondary type of wife to the governor, even though he did marry her, in order to allow her son to have the great opportunity to be educated and to become something in his life. And for about a 12 to 13 year period, this is how Constantine, Helen, and Flavius live. Now we see Helen and her greatness manifest as a wife. Even though overcoming insurmountable odds as a peasant woman, she became the true wife of Flavius because of her commitment. Two of the emperors of the time, Diocletian and Maximian, were looking to solidify power, and they had targeted Flavius uh, as a, a Caesar for that area. And in doing so, though, they had a stipulation in order to, uh, in order to preserve unity, in order to preserve uh, trust and confidence, they asked Flavius to divorce Helen and to marry Maximian's daughter, Theodora. Do whatever you need to do, take care of her, but you've got to move up because you've got a great promising career. So indeed, he divorced Helena. Uh, I don't think he had a whole lot of choice. I think in those days, it was pretty much expected that a man had, in that position, in that stature, had to marry uh, within his position. However, in the agreement, Flavius insists that Constantine be allowed to be near his mother in the east now, sends him out to the east, and to receive training in the Imperial Guard of Diocletian. So now she's out. She's out, she's in, she's out again. And obviously the rejection must have been uh, just terrible for Helen to endure. So here's Helen, a fully mature woman with a son, abandoned by her husband, abandoned by the father of her child, while he goes off with what we today would perhaps call a trophy wife someone who advances his career, who makes him look good in the eyes of the empire, but in fact, um, that marriage is a betrayal of Helen. It's thought at that point that Helen becomes a Christian. So here again, we see that, that struggles take on their perfect and true meaning only in the context of Christ, where they're seen as, as not intrusions, but as opportunities and they're seen as 
having a greater reason for occurring. Flavius does marry then the emperor's stepdaughter, and Helena and Constantine are close together in the east. Helen is able to see Constantine advance as a soldier, as a military man. But he learned also a lot of the mechanisms of how imperial, imperial life works, about the intrigue and all of the kinds of dangers and, and the way the politics, the way things happened. At this point, St. Constantine falls in love with a young woman. Her name is Minervina. They have an affair. She becomes pregnant and gives birth uh, to a child. She dies in childbirth. The child will live. It's a male child. His name becomes Crispus. And one can almost sense the pain of St. Helen seeing history repeat itself, because more than likely, here again would be a child who would perhaps not know his father, Constantine at that time now, going on with his career, uh, going now into other military campaigns and battles. Very easily, St. Helen could have just forgotten about that child, about that incident. She chose not to. She took the child into her home. She raised this child as her own. That was St. Helen. Now we see the third phase of, of Helen's true greatness, that as a grandmother, understanding life on a completely different level because now she's a Christian, she has Crispus in the neighborhood in the area and watches over him and directs him much like she directed her own beloved Constantine. In 306, at the age of 51, Flavius, Constantine's father, is dying. Constantine rushes to his father's side, barely makes it there in time to see his father alive, and shortly thereafter, Flavius dies. The troops immediately rallied to Constantine and placed him on their shield and proclaimed him to be the Caesar. But it is only an emperor that can make you a Caesar. So Maximian, as he did with Constantine's father, insists with Constantine that Constantine marry his daughter Fausta. And so at the age of 34, 35, here we have now Constantine emperor and married. And Helen, again now, is close with him. Many years later, now Constantine has become emperor himself, has risen uh, through the ranks and become emperor. And one can wonder what the mother, Helen, is thinking. Number one, there has to be a bit of satisfaction that her son has risen through the ranks and succeeded. On the other hand, uh, the mother always worries. Helen must have been worrying that her son not only uh, has now become emperor, but hopefully that he will contain himself, he will be disciplined, he will be fair. He won't do damage, he will do only good. One of the first things that he did was to issue the Edict of Milan. The Edict of Milan officially ended the persecution of Christians. It made it legal for Christianity to exist. For the first time in history, we have an emperor who makes Christianity a legal religion. Christianity is no longer an illegal religion. Secondly, Constantine also gives back all confiscated property reinstates positions of individuals of high status and begins to promulgate from that point on various laws that favor Christianity. One of the things that we do underestimate possibly today in our society is the power of a mother. Many times we like to say that fathers and mothers play similar roles, but it's very difficult to really pinpoint the heart of a mother and their care and concern for their child. Many mothers have said over the years that I don't care how old my child is, I don't care how old my son is or my daughter is, I will continue to offer advice, I will continue to care and love. Uh, Helen certainly played this role. And the, the fact is she had a great influence on her son into the later years. So this roller coaster ride that is Helen's life has another dip. Crispus, the son of Constantine, her grandson, who she raised again like her own, is being honored in his 10th year of military service. Constantine decides to go to Rome to celebrate this great anniversary with Helen, his mother, with Fausta, his wife, and his two other young sons. Unfortunately, it was here the tragedy would befall Constantine and St. Helen once again. Fausta now, wanting to make sure that her children moved along the imperial ranks to great power, she felt a little threatened now by Crispus, who was Constantine's first son, and began to slowly conspire against Crispus, hopefully to maneuver herself and her son, Constantine, 
the second into position. St. Constantine's wife, Fausta, approaches him and says that Crispus had attempted to seduce her. And giving some question of sexual encounter, Constantine, of course, became very jealous and had his son, who he came to honor, imprisoned. It is suspected that while Crispus was in jail, Fausta herself took it upon herself to uh, inform the guards and others that uh, the, the emperor, Constantine, wanted uh, Crispus killed. She perhaps may have even forged papers to that effect, and before Constantine knew that what was happening, Crispus was killed. When Constantine finds out about this and learns who's responsible, his wife and a few others, he decides that Fausta will be executed. Eventually, he takes Fausta and executes her by having her put in scalding, hot, boiling water and kills her. That devastated Helen. She raised the boy. That devastated him. What a major blow that must have been. What a betrayal. Because not only had she lost her grandson, but in a greater sense, she also lost her son. This was not the child she raised. In my heart of hearts, I think by this time, Constantine was a tortured man. On the one hand, he was coming to terms with some of the insights that he was given by his mother, by the witness of the Christians themselves, and yet he, he felt compelled by this urge for power. Um, and yet he couldn't, uh, he, he couldn't come to terms with both. And you say, my Lord, is this the saint we commemorate? Yes, because great saints were once great sinners. Great saints like Paul were themselves murderers and abusers. But there comes a time in the life of every great sinner where you realize what you've done, you've misspent a life, and you've caused great cruelty. And in due time, I think uh, Constantine the Great it was late in his life, to be sure, but from being a great sinner, he ended up life uh, through repentance by being a great saint. For sure, Helen was not just disappointed, but devastated by what her son did. I mean, this is, this is someone whom she bore. And just as we would say, how, you know, how could a person that I bore and raised do such a terrible thing? What did I do wrong? Perhaps she, she thought the same thing, but a mother is a mother. It is, it is that special quality, it's, it's that Christ-like quality of unconditional love. doesn't mean that she approved of what he did. No more that we, who, who refer to Constantine as Saint Constantine the Great and equal to the apostles, that doesn't mean that because we confer that title upon him that we approved of what some of the things that he did, but still, because of her unconditional love for him as a mother, uh, she still loved her child and uh, had an influence on him. Having yet experienced now another tragedy, but one can argue the greatest tragedy, an actual death now, not just a divorce, not just a pregnancy, but the death of her grandson. Again, where most people would have taken time off and just uh, allowed themselves to mourn for who knows how long, uh, Helen here does not again roll over and play dead. Uh, motivated, inspired by only God, uh, she then uh, takes it upon herself to go to the Holy Lands to attempt to retrace the steps of Jesus Christ. For Helen the Empress, though, it's really as she is in old age that the most significant events in her life for which she's remembered by the church take place. Helen is the first real pilgrim to the Holy Land. She was so awestruck by the fact that Jesus was crucified for us, for our sins, that she wanted to see that cross and find that cross. And she hunted and she went to the place where all the crosses had been discarded after the, the criminal crucifixions in the city. It was kind of the junkyard. It was barren, it was desert. As she was searching, she saw a spot of uh, Vasiliko of a basil plant growing there where you would expect it not to be growing. And she tells her, uh, her workers, her soldiers, to dig there. And there she finds the three crosses that were involved in the crucifixion of our Lord. And she said, this must be the place. This is the sign we were looking for from God, and taking with her the patriarch, Makarios of the time, 
She dug down and found many crosses. How was she going to find the cross of Christ? St. Helen was very smart and asked that sick people, lame people, blind people from the city of Jerusalem be brought to that place. And they began to put people on top of the crosses. And there was one cross that healed somebody, some ill person. They put another person on that cross and another person on the cross. It must have been an incredible sight. It must have been an, an awesome sight to see St. Helen humbled in front of the cross of Jesus Christ, the one he was crucified on. My mind in thinking of Helen always goes to the wedding service. And when the priest is before the couple, at, towards the end of the service, there's a prayer that says, may you have the joy that the blessed Helen had when she found the cross of Christ. And for me, there's always a sense of the joyfulness of Helen, even though she's a woman who's been through so much tragedy. And I think that's the, the incredible, I think that's the, the, the glue that ties this whole story together, that in Helen, her faith, and especially later on when she goes to the Holy Lands and finds the cross and all the relics that later go into the different churches, that she maintained through her faith such a joy through all this terrible circumstance. And she built churches and established the first communities of real churches, the church in Bethlehem that is still there, the church of the nativity she built, uh, the church where we have the resurrection, the crucifixion of our Lord uh, in Jerusalem, uh, the church of the Holy Sepulcher. Uh, she built church in Nazareth and other areas, and she left these as precious jewels for us to continue to have today to mark the life uh, and death and resurrection of our Lord. The building of all of these churches in Jerusalem is significant in the sense that it established and rooted Christianity again. It gave a kind of a geographical footing for everything. And this also is why Constantine and Helen are commemorated in every service in the Church of Jerusalem. Those people for all of those generations had suffered more than anybody else. They were the earliest Christians. And when Christianity was allowed to come out into the open, they felt the relief the most and felt the most indebted. To this day, if you go to a church service in Jerusalem, you're going to hear the commemoration of Constantine and Helen and the dismissal of the service. So after the time of her most brilliant glory of finding the cross of Christ and going through the Holy Land and finding other holy relics, she returns to her home where she dies at a ripe old age with her beloved Constantine by her side. Constantine must have marveled watching this great woman die, this woman who had all the odds stacked against her in a society where women were second-class citizens, in a society where unwed mothers were outcasts, in a society where peasants couldn't be the wife of the Caesar or the emperor, in a society that exiled people to far-off distant places, she did all of this. She rose to the occasion, her greatness as an unwed mother, her greatness as the woman of somebody very powerful and very rich, being stripped of all of that and being cast into exile, as a woman very in love with her children and her grandchildren, being taken away from that, watching her grandson slaughtered and executed, as a woman seemingly defeated in her old age, rise to her greatest epitaph and have that written in what she did in the Holy Lands. Uh, he must have marveled at this and indeed it gives any woman that believes that she is alone in society the hope and the direction and the strength and the power derived from this role model, this great individual Helen who against all odds succeeded and gives us an example that few have ever given. Tu stavros uton dipon men uranote aisamenos, ke oso Pavlos din glisin uk exanthropon dexamenos, o en vasilemsin apostolos ukirien. Vasilevus an polin, dikiri su parethes.
ετών ειν περίζωσε διά πάντος εν ειρήνη πρεσβείες της Θεοτόκου μόνε φυλάς.